Thank you, Lars, for a very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here yet again. <laughs> and thank you for coming out. It's a beautiful evening. Uh, I'm glad quantum mechanics drew you out here. So I am part of the program on open quantum systems. I shall talk about quantum mechanics and to what extent the openness of quantum systems help us understand how the classical emerges out of the quantum substrate. We know that our universe is quantum. Every controlled experiment done in the laboratory proves that all the pieces we can control behave quantumly. On the other hand, we are deeply convinced by a poorly controlled experiment that in everyday life, we do not encounter quantum weirdness. So where does this quantum weirdness go away? This is a theme of my talk. I will start discussing weirdness, and I hope we'll get to its demise. <laughs> Let me start with what is a bit of a cliche, uh, but I start with it because you've probably seen it. Schrodinger's cat. You know the story. A uh, paper was written by uh, Schrodinger in 1935. It, it uh, uh, changed the way people thought about quantum mechanics, in part because it forced us to take seriously the idea that quantum theory is the theory of everything. So what uh, Schrodinger's thought experiment is it consists of a um, nucleus, sorry, jumped ahead, consists of a nucleus um, of radioactive nucleus uh, which is going to decay. This is a quantum system. If the nucleus decays, it will unleash uh, what Schrodinger called the following diabolical contraption. <laughs> a hammer uh, upon detection of, 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 of the decay of the nucleus, will strike uh, a, a vial with poison, and the cat uh, will die. Now, the question that uh, Schrodinger posed with this Gadanian experiment is, can we really take quantum mechanics seriously or have we an, uh, some other way of avoiding its consequences at a macroscopic level? Because what this diabolical contraption seems to indicate is that quantumness can be inherited from a clearly quantum object, atomic nucleus, by a clearly macroscopic object of the sort of systems that we are dealing with. So the concern is that because this nucleus, halfway through its decay time, is in a superposition of being decayed and undecayed, the cat at the corresponding time will be in a superposition of being alive and dead. That's worrisome. <laughs> and it's not that it's going to be either or. It's going to be both simultaneously. Let's see what are we, why are we forced into this very uncomfortable conclusion. The key culprit is one of the key principles of quantum mechanics. It's a principle of superposition. It says that a combination of any two legal quantum states of a quantum system is also a legal state of that very same system. So for example, if we are dealing with a spin, which can be up or down, 
then a state, which is a combination of the two, is a legal state. For a spin, it corresponds to pointing somewhere else. Now, this funny notation is called Dirac notation. Do not be alarmed. <laughs> Throughout the rest of the talk, Dirac notation is essentially equivalent of quotation marks. So when I say when I say that a cat is in a superposition of dead and alive, this means cat alive, cat dead. <laughs> Quotation marks. Of course, we are uncomfortable still, notation notwithstanding. So the question is, what do we do about this? I mean, clearly we don't see cats in superposition of very different states in our daily life. Something presumably happens. And let's see how hard are we forced to worry about this. Where does it come from, that concern? It comes really from what I would call quantum, quantum constitution. We hold, and here is we, the physicists, hold these truths to be self-evident. And here they are. They may not sound that self-evident to some of you in the audience. What I told you <coughs> already, any combination of quantum states, state vectors of a system is a legal state, superposition principle. That's part one. Part two is evolution rotates state vectors, and, and what's worst, and that was exhibited in the case of Schrodinger's cat, evolved superposition of two states of a state vector is given by the superposition of two states evolved separately. I'm sorry, it's a mouthful. This is what it means. If the consequence of this state is this state of the cat, and a consequence of this state is cat happy and, and still alive, then if I start my system, my spin, in a superposition, of up and down, then necessarily the outcome of the quantum evolution is going to be a superposition of the consequences. Notice this sign actually matters. These two states, before there was a plus, this is a minus, are distinguishable for a spin. And therefore the consequences will also be distinguishable. Now, Worrying about the superposition of cat in two quite different states and worrying about the sign in the middle of that superposition is a lot to take. So let's see where does it take us. Quantum constitution again. We hold these truths, etc. Self-evident. That's not the real point. The real point is that these truths were confirmed by every laboratory experiment to date, including on increasingly large systems. So we have no choice but to accept, at least as a problem, this. Now, by the way, this business of where you take a system in superposition and make other system influence the other system by the components of that superposition, as what happened in the, cat, in, in the case of Schrodinger's cat, is known as a phenomenon of entanglement. This is an entangled state. Neither of these two systems in this state is entitled to a state of its own. There is one global state for the whole thing. That's what quantum mechanics tells us. Um, Schrodinger's paper coined this word entanglement, which is now very popular because people count on it for quantum information processing, etc. So entanglement appeared 
along with the diabolical contraption. So we know now what the problem is. Quantum theory insists that the outcome is a superposition, and it is an entangled state. And quantum evolutions mandate this sort of uh, uh, sequence of events in time. Instead of two alternatives, we get both of them. And the sign matters. Now, Schrodinger sprang up this surprise at the time when quantum mechanics was about 10 years old. People weren't really buying it. And for a long time, some very prominent people who Help, helped bring in quantum mechanics uh, and, and formulate it, were uncomfortable with it. So this is a proof from clearly an authority, letter written by Albert Einstein uh, to Max Born, another father of quantum mechanics, dated 1954. So this is close to 30 years after the beginnings of quantum mechanics, um, and a year before Einstein died. He died in 1955. What he says is, let psi 1 and psi 2 be two solutions of the same Schrodinger equation. You don't need to worry about an equation. He says two quantum states. When the system is a macro system, can of Coke, I have it especially here for demonstration, and when psi 1 and psi 2 are narrow with respect uh, to position, so the coke can be here or it could be here, then in by far the greater number of cases, this is not true for the superposition. According to quantum mechanics, coke should be able to be both here and there. That says someone who knows what he's talking about. So, narrowness with respect to macro coordinates position is not only independent of the principles of quantum mechanics, but is moreover incompatible with them. The fact that things are local, that cats are not both then alive, etc., is incompatible with the principles of quantum mechanics. So let's check if, if where it leads us, and, and uh, uh, let's first check if experiments confirm. This is an experiment which was performed uh, by Akira Tonomura, who uh, was uh, a researcher in Hitachi Labs, so that's why uh, the transparency has... Uh, uh, markings of Hitachi on, on, on the device. He was, uh, he was investigating electron uh, microscopy. So what he did is he had a source of electrons, and these electrons could go two different ways around a wire and end up on a detector. He shot them up one at a time, and eventually he got this interference pattern. That means that the electrons had to go both ways around the wire. Otherwise, interference pattern would not have formed. A another um, schematic for a similar experiment <laughs> is here. And I I'm actually going to follow this in, in, in a brief demonstration of the superposition principle. Let me see if this works. I'm going to have to go uh, to the back for a moment. And I hope this thing controls the controls from, from the back. So what I have here is two laser pointers. 
And what I will do is shine them on the screen. Now, laser pointers have been gently modified. I don't know if it's visible, but there is an interference pattern going sideways away from the central spot. So what did I do? I glued a hair across the beam. So this is, you know, instead of having a skier going both ways around the tree, uh, experiments with human subjects are require a lot of paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen that experiment performed unwittingly on the hill, and the outcome wasn't quite satisfying. <laughs> I'm going to do it, or I'm doing it, with photons. Here's another laser pointer, again, with a hair glued across. Let me just see if I can control it. Uh, I need to get the hair to obey. Oops. Yes. So the thing to pay attention to is these uh, modulations of the light intensity on the side. So every photon goes both ways around the hair. So in other words, This is actually what should have happened. <laughs> so we now see superposition experimentally, and I'm a theorist, experimentally that superposition principle works. So far, superposition principle was threatening our view of reality. Let us see if we can get something useful out of it. What can superposition and entanglement do for us? Information can be encoded into quantum states of microsystems. It can use, be used to entangle one microsystem with another. Here there are no objections, like with a cat. This actually happens. People have checked it in experiments. These entangled states have been measured to death, and they are there. And entangled information can be shared securely between different parties. This is the basis of quantum cryptography. One can use it to teleport unknown quantum states. This has been also done. Uh, I think a year or two ago, Chinese group teleported something from China to a satellite. So you can do a teleportation like things. And above all, it can be manipulated by quantum logic gates in order to explore the possibilities of quantum computing. So very roughly, how does quantum computing work? It's really a, an experiment in a giant amount of entanglement. What you are dealing is with are two quantum systems. One of them is a control. That was the nucleus decaying in the case of uh, the uh, Schrodinger cat. And the other is target. That's the one that's going to get modified. It used to be the cat in the situation we discussed before. Quantum gate couples two qubits two quantum bits, through a conditional operation. So if A is true, then do B, like in Schrodinger cat case. This is known as controlled not gate. If the control bit is one, the one in the top wire, then you flip the other one. 
This is sort of mimicking the gates one uses in classical computers. The point is that in classical computers, you would have either or at this point. This is a crux. Here you have both. So with a sufficient amount of these gates, you end up being able to explore many more possibilities than you would with a classical computer. In particular, and that's, I'm going to sort of reverse the question, it turns out that if you um, want to simulate exactly the quantum state of a system consisting of a few spins, then the biggest classical computer that can deal with it today uh, can do that for about 35 spins. If you want to do it for 36 spins, you need to double the size of that classical computer. The reason for that is that each time you perform an operation like this, you double the number of possibilities. Now, one can use these sorts of gates to create massive controlled entanglement. And this can be used to process information. So in a sense, you are running parallel processing, but on a single piece of hardware. Now, of course, turns out it would be exceedingly useful if you could do it. There are killer apps that various government agencies and, and, and private industry are interested in. However, however, it's not that easy. What's the problem? The problem is that this massive amount of entanglement is vulnerable to the same sorts of instabilities that made it impossible for the cat to persist in a superposition of dead and alive. So in other words, and here is again another diabolical contraption. Control bit was the nucleus. Whatever thing ha happened or didn't happen to the cat, cat was the poor thing serving as a target. So there is a very close parallel between what happens in a quantum computer and what happens in Schrodinger's cat paradox. And in fact, that is a problem with quantum computing. Whatever, whatever makes it difficult for the cat to be in superposition makes it also very difficult for the quantum computer to stay in superposition of all the possibilities. In fact, the Schrodinger cat problem is related to a famous, another famous quantum measurement problem, the measurement problem. Basically, CAT serves as a measuring apparatus for a quantum system. Uh, depending on the state of its well-being, it detects the nucleus either in an undecayed or decayed state. So it's clear that it's going to be tricky to get quantum superpositions and, and, and entanglement to do what we want them to do. Um, and part of the problem is a problem with observation. And here's a Dilbert cartoon uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, this is the famously, famously useless employee <laughs> and his director. I'll just let you admire it in peace. <laughs> So what actually happens? Uh, we know that something else happens, that in our daily life we don't see superpositions. Let's come back to the experiment of Akira Tonomura and examine this picture at the very end. Or, you know, somewhere, anywhere along the way. By the way, he was very careful to have a source which was 
so weak that the electrons were emitted very rarely, so there was only one at a time between the source and the detector. This ruled out any sort of collective uh, uh, cooperation between, between uh, electrons. So every one of them had to go both ways of the wire. On the other hand, every one of them eventually made a single dot. This is the heart, the crux of, of uh, 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 wave particle uh, uh, duality. Um, and it's clear that somehow something liquidates the superposition, the electron being all over in a nice interference pattern, and demands for uh, that electron to declare where it is. So let's revisit uh, our constitution and let's see if there are ways around it. Actually, there are no ways around it. You can do it by fiat. And people who invented quantum mechanics, in particular Niels Bohr, did it by fiat. He added amendments to the quantum constitution. Here are the amendments. The blue one is innocuous. People do not worry about it. It basically says, if you've measured something and it is in a certain state, and if you, then you can always check that it's still in that state if it didn't have time to move. So repeated measurement yields the same result. But the ones in red are a subject of great controversy. So the first one says the result is not the pre-existing state of the system, but an answer to a multiple choice question posed by the observer, by the measurement. Different multiple tests are usually incompatible. Let me dwell on it a little bit. So I have a system, a quantum system. Something I take for granted when I'm in a classical world that, is that I can find out what is the state of that system. In quantum mechanics, this is not the case. In quantum mechanics, you walk up to that system and you formulate a question. And it's going to give you the answer to that question. And it's a multiple choice question. You give it a bunch of options. It's going to say option number five. It's not going to be the state of the system. It will have a relation to the pre-existing state of the system, but it will not be it. Well-known example of that is Heisenberg's indeterminacy. You can ask about position, and you will get an answer. But if you ask about momentum, the answer you got about position is going to be invalidated by asking a multiple choice question about momentum. Essentially, every pair or every collection of observables, as they are called, in quantum mechanics you will encounter has that property. Measuring one invalidates uh, answers you've had before to the other one. Uh, you can uh, get a probability of an outcome, and it's given by the pre-measurement state vector, but it's not the pre-measurement state vector. It's something else. It's a vector that corresponds to the answer that the system gave you to the question you posed. And also, there is a single outcome to each run of the measurement. Now, let me confront uh, these with the uh, constitution as we remember it. So first one is any combination of quantum states is a legal state, superposition principle. The second one, evolution rotates states. Superposition of causes evolve uh, into superpositions of consequences. Schrodinger cat is, is, is our uh, cliche for this. The problem is that these amendments are unconstitutional. <laughs> if this is supposed to happen and it's mandated by the superposition of causes which forces the whole thing to evolve into superposition of effects, then a single outcome at the end of each run of the measurement is 
is incompatible with it. Also, it's kind of weird that states, things we are used to in a classical world, don't have the same sort of robustness in a quantum world. You can't find out what the state is. You can find out the answer to your question, but unless you ask about during the measurement in such a way that pre-existing state of the system is one of the answers, you will not get it. So, so why is it so? This was Bohr's idea. He didn't want to dwell on the questions having to do with interpretation of quantum mechanics at the time when there was so much to do in quantum mechanics. So he cut the Gordian knot, so to say, and said measurements are different. Measurements happen at the time when a classical system interacts with a quantum system. Now, in order to interpret quantum mechanics, and it's again Bohr's uh, view, you need to have a part of the universe which remains classical. You can shift the boundary, and you know Bohr was famously vague uh, about how he explained his things. Uh, and so people continued uh, quarreling about what did he mean. Textbooks kind of uh, cut the story short. They basically take amendments uh, somewhat at a face value. But students, uh, especially inquisitive students, are perturbed. You can't have a textbook which have a constitution and then proceeds to apply quantum mechanics in a way which is clearly unconstitutional. So, amendments are constitutional. They clash with the core of the constitution. But there is no uh, experimental reason to invalidate the constitution. It seems to be true whenever it's tested carefully. Question is, can one avoid imposing amendments and yet understand why only certain quantum states are admitted in our day of uh, reality. And so this is really the, 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 the crux of, of, of the problem that we are uh, struggling with in our program of, of open quantum systems. And uh, one of the big uh, advances um, is known as environment-induced decoherence. And this is at the heart of what happens when the quantum system is open. So, if you are dealing with a system which is completely closed, quantum principle of superposition appears to be always valid. However, systems that are macroscopic, that we encounter in our daily life, are never isolated perfectly from the environment. It turns out that the little bit of interaction which exists between the systems which we are interested in and encounter on, on, on our macroscopic level of reality are exceedingly fragile, or ex the states are exceedingly fragile to the interaction with the environment. Basically, if you look at models which are both solvable, uh, so that you can solve them, and uh, inspired by what actually happens in the real world, that, so that you can say they are quote-unquote realistic, turns out that in such a situation, there are only certain so-called pointer states which survive the interaction intact. In other words, if you have a system in one of these pointer states, it will live for a long time. So Coke can, in a specific location, can persist in a specific location. But if you were to put Coke can in a superposition of two different locations, it would fall apart into what's known as a mixture, probabilistic mixture of one or the other location. So in other words, 
these sorts of superpositions as a result of environment-induced decoherence end up as probabilistic mixtures. The environment is the environment. Anything that interacts with the system. Photons which bounce off you. Air molecules which bounce off you. That environment, in effect, acts as a measuring apparatus. It's not a macroscopic measuring apparatus like Bohr wanted, but it does know what happened to the system. The moment something knows about what the system is doing, its state ceases to be really quantum. And this is actually the problem with quantum computing. The problem with quantum computing is that it's very hard to keep the environment from knowing what of the possible branches within the uh, uh, quantum algorithm uh, is being pursued by uh, the environment. I mean, uh, things which, which, which are used to construct uh, quantum computers tend to be coupled to their environments. And this process is exceedingly efficient. I have once calculated that if you put one gram substance of substance in a superposition separated by one centimeter at room temperature and account for what's around it, the environment, it will decohere exceedingly quickly, 10 to the 40 times faster than it loses energy. The lesson from that is that the traditional measure of how well the system is isolated, which is leakage of energy, is hugely underestimating the effect of weak couplings to the environment on the state of the system, on destabilization of arbitrary superpositions. So, Schrodinger cat ends up being recorded by its environment. And we know, and one can make beautiful experiments which show that double slit experiments have the same uh, problem. If you let the environment scatter of the particles which are attempting to create superposition pattern, they will no longer uh, superpose. They find out which way the photon went, and that makes interference pattern impossible. This was done in several experiments that were testing decoherence. One of the most interesting ones and, and most convincing was done in Vienna, uh, where they have a microscopic but fairly hefty by microscopic standard system, they use fullerene molecules to do interference. And depending on how much light they shine on them, they either interfere perfectly or the intensity of interference is depleted. Um, by the way, they were working, but I, I, I suspect it's going to take a while, on trying to do the interference with virus. I, it's a much bigger system. It's much harder to decouple it uh, from, from, from the environment. So basically, the moment environment finds out about the position, about which way did the electron or whatever else is in the middle of the interference um, going, it will serve as an apparatus and it will, uh, by again, Bohr's complementarity, make interference impossible. Uh, the system will lose its particle properties. Um, let me just go through this fairly quickly and let me get to where, um, where I sum up and contrast the role of decoherence uh, with what was uh, the story classically. So this is essentially uh, Niels Bohr's view of the universe. The system is quantum. It interacts with the apparatus, but the apparatus is classical. It is declared to be classical. 
And then the observer, and here is his eye, looks at the apparatus. The state of the apparatus is well defined, uh, and you know, cat and, and, and the apparatus would be both in Bohr's view on the classical side of the divide, unless something really like with a virus would, would happen. What decoherence says is that you don't need to declare the apparatus to be ab initio classical. It will not persist in superpositions if it's interacting with its environment. So when the observer comes and looks at the apparatus, it will see it only in one of its, of its stable states. And these stable states are pre-selected by the environment. So even though the system puts the apparatus in a superposition of outcomes, the apparatus pointer is going to be read off by the environment before it is read off by the observer. Now, is this a whole story? I thought so until about 15 or so years ago. It turns out that here the environment is only a spoiler. It only messes up, destabilizes superpositions. It's actually its role, and I'm now convinced of that, and I'll try to convince you, is far more important and far more profound. So another experiment we've been conducting for 45 minutes. I am here. You are not interacting with me directly as this observer is interacting with the apparatus. You're just listening to me and you're looking at me. So what are you actually doing? You are actually using environment which scatters of me and air molecules which propagate waves that I emit to find out my state. So the next step, which takes the role of the environment beyond that of destabilizer, is what I call quantum Darwinism. And here it is. Observers only look, well, by definition, looking is interacting with a photon environment. Now, the only information that, can, that an observer can get from the environment is the information which is imprinted under the environment in multiple copies. And there is a very easy way to prove it. You're looking at me. There's plenty of photons that scatter of me. But you intercept only a tiny fraction with your eye. So there must be many, many, many more copies of the information you are getting about me, which are scattered all over the place. So the environment is a place where the systems which go classical spam everyone, the rest of the universe, with the information uh, that is stable. Now, miraculously, maybe not miraculously, but interestingly, it turns out that the states which get copied in many copies and advertised by the environment all over the place are the very same states which are stable under decoherence. And it's not hard to believe. The process which is caused by decoherence is the interaction with the environment. In order for the environment to contain many copies of a state, that state must be stable. Because, you know, if you destroyed an original each time you copied, you wouldn't have many copies. So the stable states, the pointer states, are the ones which are also appearing in many copies throughout the environment. Now, this solves one problem, which I've had with decoherence, which is still, I think, an extremely interesting uh, uh, 
uh, advanced and, and, and a very important uh, um, theory, and it's also important for quantum computing because it's the main adversary. Um, so the problem was that if you were to look directly at the system, you would end up defining the state of the system because of what Bohr said about the effects of the, of the, of the measurement to whatever, to adapt to whatever question you posed. Now, if there are many observers, they wouldn't necessarily agree without some sort of preconceived agreement on what to measure and therefore their records could clash. So you would end up without what we call objective reality. Objective in the sense that we can all agree on what it is. Quantum Darwinism solves that problem and it shows that uh, we can actually understand if we accept the idea that we are part of the quantum universe and that we live by the same rules the rest of the universe runs by, that um, objective reality will arise uh, naturally. Now, I think I am nearly at the end of... So, the environment is a witness and a communication channel through which we perceive the universe. It's a quantum universe, but I think it was Marshall McLuhan who said medium is a message. This is an example on a quantum level. And uh, this is, I think, where I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Medium is a message, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have nightmares about dead cats. Uh, I've heard these quantum computers, they're being successful. Is this true? Or how, I mean, at the end, you have to get an answer. Define success. <laughs> oh, define answer. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you're running a large computer program, you can stop and look all along the way and everything and check the answer, but... How do you get an answer from a quantum computer if what you say is true about the thermal energy 40 times? I mean, I don't see how it could ever work. So you have to isolate exceedingly well, right? And it's, uh, I mean, the, the, the killer app for quantum computing for which NASA, NSA, sorry, National Security Agency has poured in quite a bit of money. Um, is factoring of big numbers. Factoring of big numbers is important because it's uh, now the preferred uh, uh, cryptographic key. It's very hard to, to factor them. Quantum computers, if they existed, they could do it in a jiffy. <laughs> and, and even though, and there are now other applications which are less, uh, I don't know, national security related. Um, and even though there's clearly a lot of, of uh, money poured into the field, it's exceedingly difficult to make quantum computers do what they are supposed to. One of the problems is that, well, the main problem is decoherence. So the computer doesn't want, the computer doesn't stay private. And the moment it spills the beans to the environment, it's all over. The computation is no longer quantum, if it's at all a computation. Now, people are building reasonably big devices, and they are calling them quantum computers. But they are not doing what quantum computer would do. They are not staying in superpositions. Uh, there is a D-Wave uh, uh, company, which claims they have a quantum annealer, uh, we've tested it, and, and because we have one in Los Alamos, and it's not quantum. Uh, the most quantum uh, computer that we've encountered so far is the IBM computer. 
it has five qubits. <laughs> they have a bigger version, but it's not as good, not as quantum as as uh, as a small one. And the uh, crux of the problem is, in order to deal with these systems and states which are so fragile, you need to be able to do error correction. You can prove that in order to do error correction effectively, you would need to have a single gate operate with an accuracy of about 10 to the minus 4 were the initial uh, estimates. Error, uh, 10 to the minus 4, maybe 10 to the minus 3. So I think I've, uh, you've touched on the sore point of quantum computer. Uh, yeah, this, this might sound silly, but uh, if, if we took that cat and put it in a thermally insulated box, magnetically levitated and electromagnetically shielded and all, are you saying it, it would not be in a super, in real life, it would not be in a superposition of states, or could we actually, would we actually be able to say it's in a superposition? So I think it's exceedingly difficult to isolate things, right? I mean, you isolate, from photons, you can sort of isolate things. Air, you know, air you can treat as part of the same superposition. Air knows whether the cat is dead or alive, fine. Air knows, but, you know, the whole thing is in a superposition. But then there are neutrinos. They are exceedingly hard to, to, to isolate. And on top of that, if the cat is standing up, or lying down, the gravitational field will change a little bit. There is nothing that can isolate from gravitational field. End of story. So, you know, you can think of doing some crazy thing of future physics that should do it for neutrinos, uh, uh, but, uh, which is unlikely, but there's nothing Essentially, it's a matter of principle. <laughs> so, hang on, hang on, sir. Can't isolate a cat. What makes you think you can isolate um, the, the qubits inside a quantum computer? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is, um, if you can't isolate the cat, what makes you think? Then you can isolate qubits inside the computer. So I know that for some qubits, I can do it. Um, and let me phrase the question differently. Then. Why can't you do it for the cat? My point is, what is the difference between the cat and the quantum computer, except the scale? Is there any difference? Well, what is the difference between the cat and the quantum computer, except the scale? Precisely. You've answered your own question, right? <laughs> so, uh, you remember the example that I gave uh, with one gram, one centimeter, etc. In order to do a computation, uh, you can have tiny things. Uh, that are um, separated by very little, but which differ enough to encode 0 versus 1. In fact, let me go two more slides to make it dramatic. So quantum Darwinism summary, I, you've seen it more or less, or you've heard it. Typical observers do not interact directly with the system. Uh, systems and observers are based in the environment. Through the coherence, many records are deposited in the environment. The environment carries these records away. They may, may be accessed by observers, often extremely rapidly. Many people will agree. How rapidly? Well, here's an example. So it's a very specific example. Sunlight. You can isolate from sunlight, right? But, uh, but uh, here is how effective the sunlight is. And I have a system which is much smaller than my one gram. It's, I don't know how heavy it is, but it's one micrometer uh, in size. And the separation, you know, like between the two positions of Coke can here, it's also one micrometer. I calculate how many copies of that, this, that allow you to distinguish from the photons in the environment between this and this are made as a function of time. Given that sun is shining, that's the temperature of solar uh, radiation. And the answer is you get 100 million copies, whoops, in just one nanosecond. So if you can go to where it's really dark, there are no photons, temperatures are very low, and you are decoupled as much as possible from the environment, you can do it. People like Tonomura do it with, with electrons, 
which try to talk to a lot of other things. People do entanglement on fairly large scale. IBM quantum computer is successful to some degree, right? But whether you would be able to do it at the level at which you would be able to run useful programs, I think the belief is yes, but it's not going to be easy. I hope I've exhausted the question. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to sound too stupid, but again, you talk about time, and does time just flow in one direction and at the same speed everywhere? And does no. does that have anything to do with this? <laughs> it's sort of beyond the subject of this talk, and it doesn't really have to do uh, much with it. But it, you know, you know, special relativity: it, uh, how fast time flows depends on how fast you move, and so on. So, so. Uh, Basically, I'm, I, I'm going to postpone the question until, until the informal discussion, because I think it will take us away from, from what we are talking about. Uh, brief question. Why is it not possible to distinguish between uh, uh, small quantum uh, phenomena like electrons, which also have wave properties, they have dual nature, and a cat, which, is, uh, which does not have? Uh, I think Einstein, see, the question was, do you mean to tell me that the moon is not there if I don't look at it. Absolutely. So uh, I think this is part of the answer. And part of the answer is the example I told you about before. One gram, one centimeter, uh, and, uh, room temperature. If you drop from room temperature to nano Kelvin, which people do, if you deal not with one gram, but 10 to the minus 23rd uh, grams or so, which is, you know, a single atom, etc. And if uh, the separations are tiny, or maybe there's no separation, maybe there's a single atom uh, which is in an excited or ground state, then you can do it, right? So the part uh, of, 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 of what Bohr said, that macroscopic is classical, is true, but we now understand why. It's classical because it's exceedingly hard to decouple from the environment. Okay, well, let's thank Wojciech one more time. <laughs> and as usual, there should be refreshments in the lounge for those of you who want to continue interacting.